current view uh, is uh, formulated by uh, so-called big, big Bang Theory, after which the TV show was named. Uh, it's interesting. I didn't. I don't watch it really. Uh, but what I've heard, little clips here and there, their science is impeccable, and very current. So, excellent job. Uh, but not all scientists are nerds. Um, so basically, according to this uh, Big Bang theory, uh, the universe, including space and time was created in one giant explosion and the universe and space and time have been expanding ever since. So it's important to realize that as we've talked before when uh, we discussed uh, the Hubble's law. It's not that the explosion occurred in a pre-existing space, as if I would have a firecracker here going off, right, in pre-existing space. No. What is happening, actually, the space itself was created. Space and time, space-time, were created at that moment. And the space, or space-time, itself is expanding. So, as we discussed before, this certainly is um, consistent with uh, the Hubble's law which results from uh, observation. And then we can pose the question, OK, can we use the Hubble's law to estimate the age of the universe, right? To calculate the time uh, uh, since the Big Bang. That time obtained from the Hubble's law is often referred to as the Hubble's time. So the argument goes like this. At time zero, just soon after the Big Bang, where everything was much closer, two galaxies were much closer to each other. And now they are separated by some distance uh, d, right? So after the Hubble's time, the two galaxies that were just sitting on top of each other are separated by, a distant, uh, by the distance d. And say, this is our Milky Way, and we see another galaxy at a distance d receding from us with certain recession velocity v that we can determine from the redshift of its light. So on one hand, the Hubble's law tells us that that distance is related to uh, uh, the recession speed in this way. Right? That the recession speed is the Hubble's constant times the distance. On the other hand, if uh, this other galaxy was moving with speed v for this time, the Hubble's time, the distance it covered is simply going to be the product between uh, the recession speed and the elapsed time. So we can actually uh, 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 put this here, a result for the recession speed in the above equation to get this, divide out the distance, and get that the time since the Big Bang, according to the Hubble's law, is 1 over the Hubble's constant. Okay? So remember that 1 over the Hubble's constant will give you an estimate for um, the age of the universe from the Big Bang until now. And we know uh, the, uh, what the um, value, uh, the current value of the Hubble's constant is. It's uh, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And when you do the calculation, you uh, end up with the Hubble time of about 14 billion years, which is actually quite close. I mean, there are certain corrections that have to be done to this simple estimate. but the result that you get is actually quite close to uh, the actual value. So our universe is just under 14 billion years old. That much time has elapsed uh, uh, from the Big Bang. OK, so 
what evidence do we have that indeed such an explosion uh, occurred? And the scientific argument points us uh, in a particular direction. Right after the explosion, uh, the universe had to be very hot and very dense. Right? Uh, but as it expanded, it started to cool. So as it expanded, its temperature dropped. Uh, <coughs> When the temperature initially, uh, when it was very hot, it was a dense mixture, a dense soup of electric charges, electrons, protons, neutrons, and also photons. But because of high density of electrons, these photons could not propagate freely. They would constantly be uh, scattered. So the universe was initially opaque because the light could not travel through it. Right? It's just like uh, a light coming through the fog, right? The light at uh, visual wavelengths is constantly being um, redirected by the droplet of, dro droplets of, of, of water in the mist, so it doesn't reach us directly. So this is an analogy uh, to the fact that when we had this dense mixture of charges that would uh, scatter uh, the photons very effectively, they could not propagate freely. When the temperature dropped to about 3,000 degrees Kelvin, and that is about uh, a temperature of a filament in the light bulb, 3,000 degrees Kelvin, uh, it was possible for protons to capture electrons and form neutral hydrogen. So the electrons were, so, so to speak, removed. They were bound to uh, uh, protons, and now the light could propagate freely. The universe became transparent to light. And I illustrate this with a little diagram here. So in the beginning, the universe was a dense mixture of protons, the circles with plus inside denoting the charge and the electrons and because it was very hot uh, these particles were moving at high speeds and uh, because the charges scatter light effectively the photons were constantly being redirected they were constantly being scattered and they could not propagate uh, freely through this dense soup of electric charges. But after about 380,000 years, uh, when the universe expanded and as a result cooled, it was possible uh, for protons to capture electrons and form neutral hydrogen atoms. Right? Initially, there was too much energy for uh, electrons to be bound uh, to individual protons because uh, uh, the, 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 these uh, atoms would collide each other, ionize each other, their energy of motion would go into internal energy and kick out the electrons. So it was not possible initially to have something like this. Once the electrons were, so to speak, removed from the game by being captured by protons, then the light could propagate freely. Right? The universe uh, became transparent to light. Uh, now, <clears throat> the radiation is always in equilibrium with matter. And uh, because radiation, when the universe became transparent to the light, uh, had to uh, obey so-called Wind's law or black body radiation law, that it, as it is uh, more often uh, called. And we discussed, at least those of you who took Astronomy 1P01 will recall uh, our discussion of the Wind's law. Basically, any source emits electromagnetic radiation of all possible wavelengths. Okay? 
but the wavelength at which it emits most of the energy depends on the surface temperature of the source. So the cooler the source, the longer the wavelength at which uh, 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 most of the energy is emitted. And the Wind's Law tells us that this wavelength at which most of the energy is, is emitted can be obtained in nanometers by dividing this constant here, which is uh, 3 million, with temperature in uh, degrees Kelvin. Or alternatively, if we measure the wavelength at which we detect the highest intensity of radiation, we can determine the surface temperature of the source by uh, dividing this constant with uh, the wavelength at which most of the energy is emitted. Okay? So when uh, the temperature was 3,000 degrees Kelvin, I would have to divide uh, uh, 3 uh, million with 3,000, I get 1,000 nanometers. 1,000 nanometers is uh, how much? So we get about a millimeter, right? And that corresponds to microwave range of radiation. Okay? So uh, uh, for 3,000, we get uh, uh, 1,000 nanometers, right? So one nanometer is 10 to the minus uh, uh, 9 meters. But because of the gravitational redshift caused by the expansion of the universe, that wavelength that corresponded to 3,000 uh, degrees Kelvin has now increased because the universe has expanded. So if uh, it expanded as it did thousand times, that wavelength now should be uh, 10 to the 6 nanometers. Okay? So once again, um, when the temperature dropped to 3,000 degrees, the wavelength at the maximum of radiation was 1,000 nanometers at that time. But since then, uh, the universe expanded 1,000 times. And as a result of a cosmological uh, redshift due to that expansion of space, this wavelength corresponding to maximum had to increase by a factor of 1,000. So 1,000 times 1,000 is 10 to the 6 nanometers. So now that wavelength should be 10 to the 6 nanometers, which is 10 to the minus 3 meters. That is 1 millimeter. And a wavelength of 1 millimeter corresponds to um, microwaves. Uh, by the same token, uh, if I now put in here uh, the wavelength uh, corresponding to the maximum now, uh, because the wavelength has gone up by a factor of 1,000, the temperature now should be 1,000 times smaller. That is, it should be 3 degrees. OK? So this uh, relic radiation resulting from the moment when the universe became transparent to light and is known as microwave uh, 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 background radiation or uh, cosmic microwave background radiation uh, should be all around us. We should be able to detect it uh, when we uh, put our microwave detectors in any direction, day and night. These relic photons from the moment when the universe became transparent to light are passing through us all the time. And indeed, this radiation was uh, first observed 
1964 by two uh, uh, physicists at uh, Bell Laboratories. Uh, they were actually working on a uh, new uh, uh, antenna uh, for microwave communication with the satellites. And uh, initially, when they saw that there is always a hiss uh, that they detect. No matter whether they did their observation at day or night, no matter which direction they pointed their antenna to, there was always this noise. So they thought that maybe there's, there are some imperfections in the antenna. They went to inspect and uh, uh, saw that there is a, a pigeon dirt in the antenna, right? So they cleaned it chased away the pigeons, uh, and the hiss uh, state, the noise state. Well, as it turned out, the pigeons were homing pigeons. So they would come back and dirty up the antenna again. And they initially first caught them and drove them at a distance, um, uh, released them, uh, but they would still come back. And uh, at that time, those were early 60s, very little attention was being paid to animal rights. Uh, they um, uh, uh, resorted to a radical solution. You know what it is, right? The noise still was there. And then they happened to hear that actually theory of uh, uh, the expansion of the universe after the Big Bang predict that there should be that microwave background radiation present all around us. Okay? So indeed, uh, they were the first to detect it, and for that, uh, both of them uh, obtained, uh, obtained the Nobel Prize. Since then, uh, there were several satellite missions launched to uh, actually examine that uh, uh, background radiation, which, by the way, was uh, it's still they could not confirm that now the microwaves, microwave radiation actually follows the black body radiation law. And that was confirmed by this satellite, COBI, a Cosmic Background Explorer, acronym for that. Here is a little photo of the satellite. And here is a part of the image uh, uh, of what it detected. So basically, Kobe found that, that this radiation is uniform to a great degree. And indeed, it follows the law of uh, black body radiation, that is the wind's law. The subsequent uh, mission uh, using W a map uh, satellite found actually slight variations in the temperature of the background radiation. And uh, the most recent one that was launched and the results are still being analyzed and collected, Planck, uh, 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 launched by European uh, Space Agency, it even had a better resolution of the background. So you see that the uh, uh, microwave background radiation uh, does not correspond everywhere to the same temperature. Here uh, are the data obtained with WMAP. Here are the data obtained by Planck probe. And the color identification gives the changes in temperature from the average value in microkelvins, okay? So they are tiny compared to about three kelvins, which is the overall temperature of uh, uh, background radiation, but there are still some fluctuations. Those that are bluish are slightly colder. Those that are reddish are slightly warmer, right? And there are different reasons why uh, these non-uniformities in temperature could have arisen. One possibility is that initially, 
uh, just after a fraction of the second, after the Big Bang. Uh, the laws of quantum mechanics tell us that there have to be spontaneous fluctuations in uh, uh, the uh, number of particles, the density, and uh, over time, these small fluctuations got blown up uh, by the expansion. So now we perhaps see the relics of these quantum fluctuations in the very early universe. And uh, there is an area in, in uh, astrophysics that actually studies this and uh, tries to infer the details about very, very early universe. 